Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and uh, we have a wonderful book this week, number one on the New York Times bestseller list in the self-help category. It's number one on Amazon in the self-help category and in career planning uh, and in a lot of other categories. So we're excited to have this book uh, hot off the press, and it's actually based upon a course offered at Stanford that is the most popular course at Stanford University. The book is called Designing Your Life, and the book uh, is written by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, and we have with us today Dave Evans is going to lay out the syllabus for us so that we can all join in in designing our lives better. I personally will need to redesign mine because uh, when you're older, you know, you've already been through the design and then you have to figure out how to do it again. Uh, Dave, how are you, sir? I'm great. Glad to be here, Bill. Thanks for having me. Tell me about uh, the first day of class when you teach Designing Your Life at Stanford. What do you do the first day? first day we talk, you know, we set expectations about, so what is this class all about, and where are we coming from, and particularly where are you, the student, coming from? Every individual walks into this conversation about what do I do with the rest of my life with a whole bunch of ideas already in their heads about the way it's supposed to work and what the answers are supposed to look like and how we're supposed to find them. Sometimes those answers are subtly buried in there, and sometimes they're explicitly defined in there, but they're in there. Um, so on the first day we talk, the first thing we do is we say, look, our, our promise to you is all we're going to do is give you some ideas and some tools. We don't promise an epiphany. We don't promise, you know, suddenly being struck by a bolt of lightning and having the call hit you. <laughs> we don't promise that a passion will erupt within you and organize your entire life. We don't promise you the perfect plan that you can execute and will organize the next 10 years of your life. We don't promise any of that stuff. And people come looking for that sometimes. Um, every now and then those things happen, but that's a happy side effect. All we promise is if you learn these ideas and tools, and then you figure out which of the ones we taught you that you really think have merit, because you have to make that decision, then you think with those new ideas and you act with those tools, you're going to be a lot better off than if you hadn't come. And that's the only expectation we set. It's just as true for the reader. We respect that the reader knows where to begin. They know what their life is, is doing. And we're going to try to empower you that with a solid toolkit, um, and then you'll figure out how to take those tools and use them the right way. What are some of the problems uh, that people have in designing their lives well? Uh, I suppose there's kind of a, a set of myths that they carry around that throw them off. Very often they do, and that's one of the first things we cover again in that first class. The first thing we talk about is what are you, what's going to happen, what's not going to happen in the class, and then the second thing is, so where are we beginning in terms of your point of view? And whether it's, you know, students in their 20s or whether it's workers in their 30s and 40s or whether it's, you know, boomers heading into their 60s thinking about what's going to be the next part of their lives, um, everyone's got some point of view. Mm-hmm. And right now in the, in the current culture, uh, for all people, and as well as young people and millennials, a couple of the really prevalent ideas are, you know, well, what's your passion? Mm-hmm. Like the first idea we should start with is you have to have a passion. You have to know what your passion is, and that will organize your life. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't work for most people. Uh, research that demonstrates that something like, you know, maybe 20, 25% of people actually know what a passion is or a one purposeful orientation that would organize the rest of their life. We think a starting place that leaves 8 out of 10 people out of the equation is a bad idea. Another common thing is you really should become your best self. There is some version of you that is so wonderful, it's better than any other, and that's the one you should figure out, and that's the life you should be living. Hmm. That's not true either. All of us contain more aliveness than one lifetime permits us to live, which means there's more than one of us in there. There's more than one bill over there. Mm-hmm. You know, so which one are we going to live? Uh, we have, none of us are going to have time to live everything that we can imagine. So if that's true, there is no single best version of you. And by the way, we're growing into a version of ourselves we haven't become yet. So how could you know the best one, even if there was such a thing? <laughs> that's not a helpful place to start. So how about, how could I grow into the next thing I'd like to continue becoming? That's a much better question. So mm-hmm. there are lots of dysfunctional beliefs that get in the way, and we have reframes for a lot of those in the book. I like how you discuss in the book 
the notion, and I think this is very typical of design thinking, is that the question needs to be reframed. And, uh, and you make, uh, I think you have a point here about how people come into uh, a course like this often thinking, what do I want to do when I grow up or what do I want to be when I grow up? And you teach them to reframe the question to what do I want to grow into? And so exactly. is that now, do you have a lot of that sort of uh, reframing of questions throughout the course? Yes, we do. And we, and, and, and they're throughout the book as well. Um, you know, things like, you know, well, what you studied in college should determine your major. And that's mm-hmm. a bad idea. Or you, you, if you don't know by the time you're 28 or 30, you're late. Well, that's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Or once you're 60 years old, it's too late. That's a bad idea. You know, mm-hmm. or, you know if I'm really going to be happy... I I really should know uh, exactly what it is I want to do, or I should absolutely be able to get paid for what I love doing. That's not necessarily true either. Lots of ideas out there that are getting in people's way. You have a statistic in the book about the number of people who don't do what they got their major in. That's that's fascinating. Can you go over that? Yeah, something like 75% of college graduates within five to ten years of graduation are working outside the field that they studied when they were in college. (laughs) So this, you know, somebody says, what are you majoring in? Anthropology. Oh, man, what are you going to do with that? You know, we don't need any more anthropologists. And that turns out to be a useless idea. Another way to look at that is, for instance, at Stanford, we currently offer about 70 different undergraduate majors, things you can get a degree in. Mm-hmm. Well, there are 7 billion people in the world, and there are more than 70 things you can do. So as soon as somebody says, you said, you know, you're, you're, you have a doctorate in, in communication. Oh, you major in communications. What are you going to do with that? Well, you actually are a communicator and you teach communications. That's great. You kind of make sense. But there are lots of things you could do with a communications degree. So this question, what are you going to do with that, as soon as there is one obvious answer, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> Very good point. In fact, a lot of times when people ask me, like a student will say, what can you do with communications? I say, what can you do without it? Uh, well put. Because there's many, and many things question, that are required. There are, we, we, we have a thing between the major and the career linkage, and we look at this and say, look, there are probably some fields where studying it thoroughly is, nece- is necessary, or at least particularly helpful, uh, to be able to do that professionally. If you want to, you want to you know, work on fuels research and make more efficient gasoline, which I'm not sure that's a good idea in the current <laughs> world, but you know, at least it should be more efficient, you might want to get a degree in chemical engineering or petroleum engineering. You know, getting a a degree in anthropology is not going to make you attractive to a chemical company if you're... ...specifically technical careers. That's only a a small subset of things going on in the world, and most of the careers in the world, the overwhelming majority of careers in the world, are not closely related to what you do in your undergraduate study. I've always uh, known that to be true, but I had never seen the statistic uh, uh, quite so uh, starkly packaged as as you did in the book. And so these are all wonderful things, I think, to teach uh, students because uh, so many are caught up in the idea that there are three boxes of life, you know, that you begin with your education, then you work for a long time, and then you retire. And uh, what your book does is teach them to mix all that up. You know, labor, leisure, and three boxes. You know, and a healthy human life has a lot of that going on all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. It's it's good to uh, be able to go to school and then work for a while and go back to school or do the two simultaneously. And thanks to the wonders, wonders of the net, you know, so much is now is possible that wasn't ever before in terms of education simultaneously accompanying uh, your career. Is is this course a MOOC course? No. It is not, it's not yet online. We, we have some module. We actually facilitate the class a little bit. Some of the material is provided in an online format. They do that as homework, then come back in ready to jump into an exercise together. But we teach the course in a very communal format. The students are organized into small groups of either six or nine students. Um, and in that small group, in a room full of maybe 70 students um, throughout, the, throughout the 10-week period, and that uh, the conversation with each other is a very, very important part of the process. It's almost impossible to figure your life out by yourself. It's actually almost impossible to hear yourself just by yourself. Mm -hmm. So we want to put people in a conversation that still works better face-to-face and in person than it does online. 
that's one of the things that's on our wish list of things to do. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is get that book done, you know, and so the, uh, the online tools, they're still coming. Now, how did you uh, come in to do this? I mean, your background, you're a co-founder of uh, Electronic Arts, and uh, which, by the way, I think I bought you a few lunches indirectly, given, given all that my kids have spent on <laughs> Battlefield and Madden, etc. cetera. Uh, but great company, great company, and you must be very proud to have co-founded that. Uh, but do you, do you bring a, a kind of paradigm from Silicon Valley into teaching this course? Well, we're really what I what I bring is sympathetic pain. You know, when I was when I was nineteen years old, and I was a sophomore in college, and trying to figure all this out for the first time myself, uh, I found it terribly difficult, and I was really unhappy with what I thought was, frankly, the lousy counsel I got from both colleges and the grown-ups and family friends, and everybody kept saying, well, have you got it figured out, Dave? Do you know yet? Do you know what you're doing yet? You know, everybody wanted to hold me accountable, but nobody wanted to help me. And I thought that was pretty unfair and pretty unkind. Um, and then as I went into my career, and I got into high tech and, and started working in companies, then start leading companies, then start forming companies, then consult the people who were forming companies, you know, a big part of that is creating not just the product, but the workplace. And what's the experience that people who work with us here are having? This is, this is their life. They're spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week of their lives here. You know, the book is, again, designing your life, not designing your career, but work is the big dog. It's the big mm -hmm. chunk at the table of our hours, and if that's not working, boy, it's really hard for life to work. And I just found lots of people really struggling with this. So then over time, as I had learned design thinking both in business and at the university, um, got a I was invited to teach a course experimentally at, at the University of California at Berkeley back in 1999, 17 years ago now, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I taught a preliminary course there. Uh, then when my partner, Bill Burnett, now got the new role he has leading the design program at Stanford, we got together for lunch and chatted about these ideas and decided to launch this thing at Stanford, and which went really well and has kind of taken off. Uh, the horse sort of bolted under us, and now we're just trying to hang on. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, it, it, as one who has taught at uh, universities for uh, many, many years, three decades, uh, I, I immediately responded to it uh, thinking, uh, absolutely, this is the answer to many a student's prayer because they get such uh, really poor guidance in this. And I've recognized it over the years because, oh, I, I might read them something from... Uh, Rilke's uh, letters to uh, to a young poet, and there's such right. resonance for them in that advice. And I said, man, they just need a whole course in this. And here's the course. Here's the book. Well, the thing we craft, the thing we worked at doing, and I think has worked pretty well, which is why we're also getting, I think, a good response to the book. Yeah, you know, the book isn't getting a good response because we're famous or people think we're important. Nobody's ever heard of Bill and Dave before. Mm -hmm. um, What's going on here is everybody has this question, and we haven't been very helpful as a culture in giving people tools. Mm -hmm. And so we don't tell students what to do. Lots of people want to do that. You should do this, and you should do, you should go into social innovation, or you should go get a good, solid job at a big company, or you should go make as much money as you can and work for hedge funds. And all these shoulds, right? And these shoulds aren't helpful, as opposed to we don't, so we don't give advice. Uh, we, we try to provide tools that you can use to obtain your own counsel. You know, you're, you're the smart person. You're in charge. It's your life. But, you know, we can help you learn how to figure it out. We won't tell you what it is you're supposed to figure One of the stories in the book I like a lot is uh, told right up front uh, about the woman who wanted to open a Tuscany-type, uh, you know, a bakery. And she did that. And everything about the story as you lead up to it uh, makes the reader feel like, good, she found her path, and then you give us a surprise. Tell that story. It's a very good example because it brings out the importance of, of the really the essence of what we mean in designing your life. And the essence of designing your life, design thinking, where you build your way forward rather than sort of try to engineer the perfect solution or analyze your way forward, which are thinking approaches as opposed to action approaches. Um, so, you know, Elise, we'll call her, was, was a, a business executive, had this passion on the side for um, uh, Italian culture and Italian food, and finally decided to go for it. She was going to go for it, make the big jump, and jump into this thing. She was going to form it. She was going to build a deli and have, a, have a, a cafe inside of it to create this Tuscan experience that she'd had before. 
and she just went for it. She applied all her business acumen and so found a place and rented it and renovated it, did this whole thing, opened a great fanfare, and amazingly enough was successful. I mean, restaurants almost always fail, and certainly first-time restaurateurs usually fail, and she succeeded, and then she hated it. <laughs> because what she did not know that she didn't know was that imagining a Tuscan experience and informing a cafe and building and designing and conceiving all this would be very exciting. But now she's running a retail establishment. She's cooking the same food day after day after day. She's hiring high school kids to come in and they quit in two weeks and you know they don't show up on time and she's reordering inventory. She's got spreadsheets all day long. And the daily life of a restaurateur was completely different than she thought. Hmm. We, you know, had we met her sooner, we said, you know, you could have prototyped that. And by prototyping, we mean small conversations and small experiences where you get to try out the future. People, you know, what you're trying to do is imagine your future. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a really easy way to do that. There are people already living in your future today, and what you want to do is go visit them. So she could have gone and found people who owned cafes that she thought were neat and said, what's that really like? Do I really want to cook that much? Well, how about volunteering to help somebody cater somebody's wedding? You don't have to rent a place. You can just do it in one weekend. You know, there are lots of ways she could have both talked to people and particularly had experiences, hands-on experiences, that would have shown her what that life really was like before she went all the way up to the 40-foot high dive and jumped off. (laughs) Oh, it's a wonderful story because it happens so much. You know, I, I had a friend who went through uh, medical school and then, uh, and then you know, graduated, got out there to become a doctor and, uh, and quit because he said, I didn't yeah. realize that I found sick people disgusting. And uh, so, he, I mean, he didn't quit entirely. He went into research medicine, you know. Uh, so uh, it's interesting how often people, I think people discover that all the time. They major in accounting and then they discover they don't like being in a cubicle all day. You know, it's not their life, uh, which which I think supports that statistic you gave of so many people gravitating away from their majors to something that uh, feeds their soul. Well, the, the, our image of something may have nothing to do with what the reality of it is. Yeah. And sometimes the way we, we teach people things, for instance, maybe the way they teach you anthropology is not the same as the experience of being a field anthropologist. Yes. Um, so, you know, when you, uh, when you imagine, you know, Gee, how, how would I like to imagine how I want to live? I know, I'll take a class. I'll go sit in a darkened room, you know, and have some old person in the front of the room on a stage talk at me for an hour mm-hmm. about a topic, a traditional lecture format, you know, which we never do anymore. But, um, and, and, and that's the way I'm going to find out what it's like. You know, I, could, I know, I'll, I'll sit in, let's say you were giving an hour-long lecture about the theory of communications, and I'm supposed to ask myself the question, would I like to be a radio host? <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. So we're really, you know, we're, we're just encouraging people to go out there in the world and have experiences to try things you can't learn any other way. So your advice is for people to do internships and that sort of thing while they're in college? Or even smaller. I mean, a really good prototype is fast and cheap but has some good learning. Like, how about a one-day shadowing? How about just having coffee with two or three people who do this kind of thing you're talking about? Mm -hmm. How about doing a small project on the side? Even an internship Mm -hmm. is typically 10 weeks full-time, you know. Uh, Let's say I'm thinking about whether or not I would like to get involved in this new, um, you know, the the future of autonomous cars. or Where's the car business going to go? Well, I could go try to get a job at Ford Motor Company. I could try to get an internship, and I have one assignment. I have one boss in one building for 10 weeks. I'm going to spend 400 hours you know, doing this thing. And at the end of that, what have I learned? Mm-hmm. As opposed to, how about, you know, I'll go have coffee with two of these guys at four. I'm going to pick up and do a phone interview with some people over at Tesla. I'm going to read a bunch of different articles. I'll meet some people who are doing research at, you know, uh, at the Autonomous Car Lab at Stanford, and I'll, I'll find out all these different things going on in the field and meet all these people. And maybe I'll even do a little side project. Maybe the guys at, at my college could help me get a, a small project I could do on the side collaborating with maybe the Tesla people or something like that. And I spend my summer that way. Now, I'm not saying internships are a bad thing, but they are, um, but they're long. That's 10 weeks of a big chunk of my life. As opposed to, let's just go and really quickly get a quick test drive. I don't want to have to rent the car for a month. I just want to drive around the block a couple of times. <laughs> That's a good point, a good point. In my own case, I was lucky because I knew when I was a sophomore in college, I knew I wanted to be a professor. And uh, my prototypes were right there in front of me. And it just looked, I said, man, these guys get paid to read. 
You know, they get paid to study, and to me that sounded great. Well, I think there, you know, I've, I've been in these conversations for 45 years mm-hmm. and, and literally talked with thousands and thousands of people about, you know, is their life working for them? And depending what people's goals are, and they vary quite a bit by the person, which is fine. Um, the people who are, you know, really looking for this lived experience of doing exactly what they have in mind, you know, whether they call that a calling or vocation or a passion, um, I will say the group of people that I have found who really do find it, particularly find it early in life. So you're a sophomore, that's 18, 19, maybe 20 years old. That's pretty early. Yes. The people in, uh, in the arts or in the academy uh, more often than not, sometimes find it early. And that makes sense to me because, you know, uh, an artist is about, you know, pure beauty for its own sake, and a, and a true academician is about true, pure knowledge for its own sake. There's something intrinsically wonderful and beautiful about, you know, I could read all day, I could swim in the world of ideas all day, Bill says, and he gets mm-hmm. all excited about that. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of thing that grows directly out of a personality. Now, very rarely would, you know, a 12-year-old or a 15-year-old have started to, to sniff out, you know what I think I really want to do is I think I want to, I want to run a region of an insurance company. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not going to just pop out of, you know, I love reading books. Uh. That's so true. Uh, I think I, I think I think some intellectuals and some artists and some musicians and some you know actors and dramatists those kinds of people in that part of the world um, sometimes get an earlier clue than others. But it's just sort of the nature of the beast. What are your success stories in terms of? Can you give me one or two cases where you said uh, this student uh, redesigned their life and uh, found great joy they were missing, or at least got on the right track in their mind? Oh yeah, well, and, and not even just students, because again, you know, um, you know, every everybody seems to think the rest of their life is pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. We just did a seminar in Manhattan with 373 people crammed into a hotel room, a big hotel ballroom, and front and center, you know, got there early to get the best seat, uh, was a was an 87 year old woman, you know, who couldn't wait to design her life and got stuck on the exercise because she had too many ideas. Uh, um, you know, because you know she's she's lived enough of life to know that life is so interesting. She just can't wait to the next thing. Um, that's that's an aspirational that's cool. mindset. So a, a couple of examples. So that, that right there is a success story in my mind. Um, but you know, one example would be a young man who 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 uh, majored in civil engineering because his mother told him to. Uh, yes. um, he didn't have a better idea. He didn't dislike it, but you know he'd never really thought about things. And then he went out and he got a job, and he kind of hated it. And said, "Oh, I'm doing the wrong thing. I picked the wrong major. I ruined my life." And we said, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. Maybe not. Um, do you know what it is you like or dislike?" And he was just about to take his father-in-law's advice and become a stockbroker, which would have been a disaster, frankly. Um, and it turned out that he loved doing civil engineering, but he was in a small firm, and he was spending most of his time taking care of client problems and handling billing issues and, and stuff that had nothing to do with doing the, the techniques of civil engineering and designing buildings and doing stress analysis. You know, and he ended up, pursuing, and he said, what I really like is working on the really hard problems. He did what we call the Good Time Journal, and he figured out what it was he did like and figured out what it was he didn't like. He didn't just jump to the conclusion, well, civil engineering worked or it didn't. This idea, if I should know, then if I should know, I should be right. If, I should, if I'm right, it should work. And he was doing something, and it didn't work. So, oh, I'm wrong. I should start all over. No, no, no. Let's break this thing down and really understand it before you make a jump. And he ended up getting a Ph.D. Um, because he wanted to do really hard problems, and now he works in a firm where he gets to spend most of his time with the door closed working on hard technical problems, and he's a very happy guy. That's a good now, story. Now, jumping to a very different story would be, you know, is this, for, is this just for elite college people? No, it's for people who care about the rest of their lives. So I know, I know a, a, a working woman. She's a single mother. She has a, a, a 19-year-old son. She has an aging mother. She has a two-hour commute each direction every day. She works full-time, and she's going to school full-time at night trying to get a degree in the hotel industry and hospitality so she can she can get out of, you know, this really, really oppressive lifestyle. So she's working her butt off. She's commuting three to four hours a day, and she's trying to take care of her one teenage son. Mm-hmm. And by the way, she's cheerful. <laughs> so she's got very, very few degrees of freedom. Very, very little room in that life to even breathe. And so, but what she looked at is, and she, you know, this is again, it's like, well, what can I do? You know, how could I make this a little more perfect? And what could I try? Mm-hmm. And she realized, you know, I got this big chunk of time in the car. 
what do I do with that? You know, and my mother's aging, and I, and I really love her. I don't get to spend, I know what I can do. She got her mother a job, frankly, kind of a crummy job, but a job at the same place where she works. Mm-hmm. So now every morning she jumps in the car early with her mom and drives all the way into work, and they get to chat and talk about her son and, mm-hmm. and hear stories, and then the same thing coming home. And so she took this very constrained life, and she redesigned her commute to be much more life-giving and she's just about to finish that degree. Hopefully she'll get a better job and not have to be, you know, working 70 hours a week just to make ends meet. So she wants that better life, but it's not easy to get. So she's doing the hard work. But along the way, what can I do? And she tried a couple of things, and she made her life better. Well, you're just collecting uh, a treasure trove of, of good stories that endorse this methodology. Well, it's been very gratifying. You know, we... we we stand in front of or we collaborate or we talk to people on the phone like I'm talking with you. Mm-hmm. And time and again, people very generously invite us into the living room of their lives, which is a, which is a very honored place to be. Mm-hmm. And we try to share these tools. And time and again, people come back and go, you know, that was really helpful. People, people come back to us and they say that I feel I can do this. And, it, and the fact that I think I can do this leaves me a little more hopeful. And so we're, we're getting people unstuck. And they're feeling a little more hopeful, and they're they're trying to get a little further along. We don't promise perfection. We don't promise you're going to get a pony for Christmas, you know. <laughs> but um, but you know, we all want we all want things to get a little better, and let's see if we can't make that happen. I loved your expression to get people unstuck because I think that's the way a lot of people feel. And very often it's because they're 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 asking too much of themselves. Like I, I'm supposed to be somewhere else. I should have done it differently before. Mm-hmm. I've, I've got myself in the wrong place. I have no idea how to back up and get out of here. Um, and, and you can't do that. There's only forward gear in life. There's no reverse gear. And we got to take it from here. You're not in the wrong place. You're just where you are. You know, so we'll take it from here. And, and all you, you don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to boil the ocean. You don't have to solve everything. You have to identify, is there something I'd like to change? It's reasonable and doable. How could I experiment with that? And let's take one step. Set the bar low and clear it. Then do it again. Then do it again. You know, small, doable steps. Uh, there's too much out there, even in the you know the self-help world or the that's going for inspiration. Like you can do it. You can be amazing. I know you're just a, the incredible you is just waiting to get out. You know, you could be your Olympic gold medal self all the time. You can do it. You can do it. And I mean, it just exhausts people. I mean, you can't live that way. Ask, ask an Olympic athlete how long they could deliver gold medal winning performance. I mean, they worked very hard to peak just exactly that one week after a four year period, and they can't hang on to it. You know, we need to give people more human, meaning more humane tools that are reasonable and doable because life is long, and we're going to be doing this for the rest of our lives. Your course is available in some form online. No, we don't. We have. We, we do provide a couple of tools for our students within the course. We do have a website which has quite a bit of material on it. It's not a course per se. Okay. It's just a repository of tools. So if you go to www.designingyour.life, so it's just the title of the book, Designing Your Life, with a dot right before the word life. Okay. Designingyour.life. That's our website, and there's a bunch of videos on there, and some of the forms and the exercises in the book you can download and and use uh, along with the book. Um, and we just keep adding more things to that, some blog articles and some links to other places we think are interesting. And we'll just keep building that website out and being as helpful as we can. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to have to uh, take us out of here. If you'll hang on just a minute, I'd, I'd like to talk to you after I wrap up the show here. We've been talking to Dave Evans for, uh, and for his book co-written with Bill Burnett called Designing Your Life, number one on the New York Times bestseller list under self-help. For Good Books Radio and for audiobooks.com, I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, signing off. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads. <laughs>